Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Wassalatu Wassalamu Ala Rasulillah, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. I'd like to welcome all of you to tonight's podcast, Life Haq, back again to its roots, where uh, we talk about uh, history, we talk about um, the Haq, as always, and uh, we try to make as many reflections as we can, inshallah ta'ala. So recently uh, in the news, and it's actually been precipitating for a few weeks now, there's a news story talking about Hagia Sophia, Aya Sophia being turned into a masjid. So currently it is a museum. And uh, why is there a call or why is there a desire? Why are there any efforts for it to be turned into a masjid? Well, because uh, prior to 1935, it was a masjid actually for almost 500 years. And uh, until obviously the uh, Ottoman Empire, you know, declined and the Khilafah came to an end, uh, the uh, there was a lot of changes that occurred because of that decline, because of that end. And one of those changes was uh, there was a lot of restrictions in terms of how Islam was practiced and also in terms of the places of worship. So, for example, major masjid uh, construction projects uh, were uh, were essentially banned and they were restricted. And we saw a lot of different changes. Uh, the Adhan was turned from Arabic to Turkish. Uh, and uh, a lot of the traditional schools of learning, ways of learning, were restricted, essentially banned. And uh, one of these policies that took place was that Hagia Sophia was turned into a museum from a masjid. So now, how did it become a masjid in the first place? So we can't really talk about Hagia Sophia without talking about a very prolific character from history. So this figure uh, is the reason that uh, Hagia Sophia became a masjid. And who am I talking about? I'm talking about none other than Sultan Muhammad Athani, Sultan Muhammad II, also known as... Uh, Muhammad al-Fatih. So he was the seventh uh, sultan in Dawlat al uthmaniyya the Ottoman Empire. And uh, depending on the history books that you read, he came to power at the age of 22 or 23, and he ruled for approximately 30 years. Now, we have to talk about, if we talk about a person, let's talk about from the beginning. What kind of upbringing did he have? And I think that's important to understand the backstory. You know, every time you uh, look at a uh, at a superhero, they always draw attention to the origin story. Where did this figure come from? So uh, before they became a legend, they were a baby. They were in diapers. You know, before someone becomes a legend and accomplishes any type of legendary status, everyone comes from some type of humble beginning. And so... His upbringing and his uh, tarbiyah, so to speak, so his self-development or the way he was developed, uh, had a very rich history and it had many people who took part within that. So uh, he was not only a sultan, of course, but he was the son, son of a sultan. So, right? so uh, you know, Sultan uh, Murad II. And uh, so there was this history of being part of this family of leadership. But that does not necessarily mean that you automatically will become a great leader. Uh, just by virtue of your position, uh, there needs to be some type of effort that's put on your part. And perhaps you have access to some type of resources or people invest in you so that you grow and you develop as an individual. So one of the people that was tasked to actually help develop him was a scholar by the name of Mullah Qurani. Now, Mullah Qurani, he was this very well-built uh, individual, this very well-built man, so he was a big person. And uh, he was tasked by uh, Muhammad II's, Muhammad al-Fatih's 
father uh, to uh, you know develop him and for him to take his education, his tarbiya seriously. Because, you know, coming from a well-to-do family, uh, having lineage, having, you know, access to a lot of the different things, you know, it's hard to become serious oftentimes in terms of your own development. Because anytime you want to develop yourself, that takes a sacrifice of time, luxury. It takes some type of effort. So uh, his father told Mullah Qurani, if you have to... Uh, you know, uh, knock him a few times, you know, beat him with with the cane, you can do it. You have my permission to do that. Even though he's uh, the Sultan, uh, they're, they're rich, they have this high status. No, no, if you have to beat my boy to make sure he's serious, you can do that. And so when Mullah uh, Qurani goes to uh, Muhammad al-Fatih, Muhammad al-Fatih, he's not taking Mullah uh, Qur'ani very seriously because he thinks like he's just like any of his other tutors or teachers. He can get away with whatever he wants. So he can joke around. He can laugh. So he was laughing at him. But then when Mullah Qur'ani took out the cane, he understood, okay, this guy is serious. Okay, I have to make sure that I um, get my act together. And he did. He did. He memorized the Qur'an in a few years. Uh, he learned uh, the uh, al deen he learned the sciences of the deen, he learned history, he learned math, he learned astronomy, he learned physics, uh, and he learned several languages. So uh, what the scholars uh, of the past would say, the languages of Islam. So what are the languages of, of Islam? Uh, he learned Arabi, uh, he learned Persian, uh, he learned uh, the uh, Turkish language. Okay, And if you mix these all together, actually, if you take these all together, uh, which would often, uh, you'd see this in the Ottoman Empire, like in the um, uh, in the in the in the campgrounds where the military would uh, would would camp out. Uh, you would have people who would speak uh, Arabic, Persian, Turkish, and so the mix of all these languages actually became known as Urdu. Okay, so Urdu is basically the biryani of all the Islamic languages, and so uh, he learned those languages. Uh, he learned. Um, uh, they say Latin, uh, Serbian, Greek. Uh, there's some weak narrations that he learned Hebrew. So he was well acquainted with uh, the language of the deen, to understand and read books of the deen, uh, be able to study the deen, and also with uh, many of the regions and the cultures that his empire had control over. And he learned military strategy. Uh, he learned the art of, uh, art of fighting. He actually was in contact, and he learned with uh, and f well, from the Sheikh of Imam al Suyuti. Okay. Uh, one of the great scholars he also learned from was Sheikh Ak Shamsuddin. And this Sheikh actually had a, a strong and very particular influence on him. And he served as a motivator for Muhammad al Fatih. He told him that you are going to be the one that conquers Constantinople. OK, so uh, he, he uh, you could say, really spent a lot of time as being a renaissance man, so to speak. Uh, he knew languages. Uh, he knew the arts. Even he uh, was a poet and he had a pen named uh, by the name of Oni. And he has a book of poetry called Dewan uh, Oni. OK, so uh, he was he, he was a, a poet. Uh, he was a military strategist. Uh, he had knowledge of the deen, of Islam. So uh, he, here's a person who knew uh, a lot of these things. And he knew history. And he knew the history of uh, the Ummah. He knew the history of his own, uh, of Dawlat al-Uthmani, of the Ottoman Empire. And at a young age, he was given uh, a lot of responsibility. Because actually, at around the age of 14... Uh, his father abdicated the throne for a short period of time. But then when European forces came to know that they have a young uh, sultan that's at the head of this empire, they tried to take advantage of the situation. And so his father came back uh, again for a brief period of time. And the reason that drove his father to do this is that his father's uh, son, uh, his son by the name of Ala, passed away. And because... He wanted to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was feeling very, very sentimental. He wanted to spend all his, 
the rest of his life in ibadah. So here was a person who was very sincere. So he was ruling with sincerity, inshallah ta'ala. He was ruling with a sense of ikhras. Uh, and because he didn't want that power, he didn't. He wasn't a power-hungry person that wanted to remain uh, on, on the mechanisms of power. That his hands are directly on the mechanisms of power. He was willing to give it to his son at a young age so that he can devote his life uh, to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And so he instilled a lot of good qualities actually in his son, in uh, Muhammad Al Fati. Uh, he, if you look at the way that he would govern. Uh, Muhammad al fatih he, he looked at developing the nation just as he invested in himself, tarbiyah in developing yourself. Uh, he was trying to develop the nation that he had command over. So he minimized uh, excessive spending and he was uh, aware of budgeting and making sure that nothing is being wasted. Uh, he put a lot of effort into improving the army. Uh, he uh, kept a lot of personal records of his soldiers, so he was able to keep records of them. He wanted to increase their salaries where he could. He wanted to make sure that they would have the latest technology and weapons. And he s tried to select the most qualified governors and leaders. And so he focused on a lot of reforms earlier on before he even thought about expansion. Okay. Now... Let's uh, talk about Constantinople for a moment. Okay, so Constantinople was a major city that was founded in the year 330 CE by the Byzantine Emperor Constantine the First, and since uh, its uh, inception, okay, it has been it was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, and it had a very strategic location. Okay, so this was a very sought after location. This was uh, a very highly regarded, well fortified city. And actually, uh, Napoleon uh, Bonaparte, he had a lot of interest in Constantinople. He held it in such high regard. And he actually wished to conquer it himself at times. And he said that if the entire world had been a single kingdom, that Constantinople would be its capital. Okay, so this is the regard that people had for it. Uh, it was, uh, you know, when you look at uh, even in Islamic history, when the Sahaba started to open the lands, the different uh, lands, and they started to conquer the Roman Empire, uh, Herakl sought refuge in Constantinople. So uh, he he went, he, he, he left uh, uh, the area in Syria, and he went to um, Constantinople to seek uh, refuge there. Uh, because if you look at it strategically, it is surrounded by you know three bodies of waters. Surrounded by the Golden Horn, is surrounded by the Bosphorus, and it's surrounded by the Sea of uh, Marmara. So it's it, it has a, uh, these natural uh, defenses and borders around it. Okay. Uh, yet, um, and even though it's it was so well fortified and it was like a jewel, it's like uh, known to be a very, very advanced city. Uh, Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam foresaw, he predicted, he prophesied that the Muslims would conquer Constantinople. Now, this is an amazing thing for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say. When did he prophesy that the Muslims would conquer these great lands? Well, let's look back at it. Battle of Khandak. The Muslims are facing extinction. They are surrounded by a uh, these confederates. Okay, uh, All of these groups, all of these armies, 10,000 strong, that come to Medina to eradicate the Muslims. And the Muslims are in such fear, some of the hypocrites are saying, we don't even feel safe to go to the washroom. Yet the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during that time, he goes and he's getting his, you know, his elbows dirty. He's he's working with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. They're digging a trench. Okay, to protect themselves, to fortify themselves. And as they're digging this trench, 
to fortify themselves, to protect themselves from extinction. These, these enemies came to eradicate the Muslims. They had enough of the Muslims. So they came to eradicate it. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, he hits a un, seemingly unmovable rock. Okay. And he says, Allahu Akbar. And just a little spark flies out of this rock. And he says that we will conquer Syria. We will be given the keys to Asham. And then he hits it again. And he says, Allahu Akbar. And a little spark comes out of this rock. And he says, we will conquer the Persian, the Persian Empire. Uh, we'll be given the keys to the Persians. And uh, the rock is still there. And think about maybe the doubters, the haters, the criticizers. You can't even break a rock. And you're saying we're going to conquer all these lands. And then the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam hits it again in a spark. And he says we are going to conquer uh, Yemen. We're going to be uh, we're going to conquer uh, you know another seemingly uh, impossible place to conquer when you can't even survive in your home city and this rock breaks apart and just as the rock broke apart the promise of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was true as well uh, in another hadith our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he says that Constantinople will definitely be liberated by a excellent man a righteous man and what an excellent Amir he is and what an excellent army that army will be. So our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam foretold this. And for a person living at the time of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, that type of challenge would be, making that statement uh, would be, you know, akin to saying like, uh, you know, uh, Moose Jaw. Okay, you guys know where Moose Jaw is? Okay, if anyone from Saskatchewan uh, logged in. Okay, Moose Jaw is like a little city, okay? So Moose Jaw is going to take over Washington, D.C., okay? That's like the type of statement that you're making. And think about all the uh, doubters and, you know, all the people will be like, okay, what, what kind of ridiculous statement uh, are, are you making, especially for the munafiqeen, the hypocrites? But uh, this was foretold by Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because... The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, always gave the companions positive reinforcement. And because he always uttered the truth, he was member of As-Sadiq al -Amin. He was the honest and trustworthy. That is why till, to this day, people take the word, the actions, the silent approval of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as an example to live their life 1.5 billion people generation after generation even after the Khilafah ended because they believe in the truth so even though Islam has very weak political power the truth is recognized and practiced by people that goes to the veracity of the blessings of the words of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so uh, the early generations they wanted to be this excellent person they wanted to be this excellent man and be part of this excellent army. And so uh, uh, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, 30, the year 33 after Hijrah, he sent an army to conquer Constantinople. And uh, he was not able to. Uh, Basar ibn Abi Arata, 53 after Hijrah, he was another uh, Sahabi who tried to go in there uh, in an army. Uh, he wasn't able to do this. Uh, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari uh, went and uh, he was part uh, of an army that uh, they were trying for years and 30,000 Muslims died trying to take over uh, Constantinople and he ended up dying uh, in this land so far away from Medina. Think about this. Trying to fulfill and by the way of age 80 years old. Okay, 80 years old, and you can actually there's a there's a beautiful masjid in uh, Istanbul uh, called uh, 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 the that's named after uh, Abu Ayyub al Ansari. 
So Sultan Ayyub uh, Masjid, beautiful masjid, and his grave uh, is there as well. And so he wanted to at least be buried as close as possible to the gates because he wanted so badly to be part of this. Uh, the uh, Umayyad uh, Sultan Sulaiman bin Abdul Malik, 98 years after Hijra, he tried, he failed. The Abbasid Sultan Harun al Rashid, 190, the year 190 after Hijra, he tried, he failed. Uh, Sel the Seljuk rulers, 11th and 12th century, they tried, they failed. And so the Ummah stopped trying for 735 years. Okay, and then uh, from the Dawlat al Uthmaniya, the, the Ottoman Empire, Sultan Bayezid, he resumed the effort. So after 735 years, Bayezid and Sultan Bayezid himself is a prolific figure. He's an amazing figure. Okay, actually, you know what his nickname is? Sultan Bayezid, his nickname is uh, Asayqa, his or uh, in Turkish Yildirim, it's it means lightning bolt. Okay. Because he was fighting, he was going between fighting uh, the Mongols and the Crusaders. Like he went, go, he would he would be fighting on two fronts, and so he moved so fast, fighting between these two fronts. And one of the efforts that he tried to do was uh, to uh, liberate Constantinople. So, uh, so others they, they they had tried, okay, but uh, one thing that Muhammad al Fatih benefited from was all these attempts that did try to conquer Constantinople because he studied them and he was able to learn from them. So 11 times, I want you to think about this before, think about this, 11 times the Muslims, they tried to conquer Constantinople. And yet here Muhammad al-Fatih is trying again. Yet uh, it's not about just trying all the time, but it's also learning from the past because our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He says in a hadith that a mu'min is not stung by the same hole twice So it's not just about just trying but it's also about learning, adjusting, reflecting, making tawbah uh, Making whatever modifications needed and then again putting your, forth your effort with Ihsan. And so here was a man who loved Islam. Here was a person who knew his deen. He had tarbiyah. Uh, you had this Mullah uh, Qurani. You had uh, Sheikh Ah Shams al-Din. He was surrounded by shiyukh. And so it was like Allah SWT prepared the conditions around him for this monumental task. Now, how did he prepare? Okay, because many times we say we want this outcome from the ummah. We want unity for the ummah. We want this for the community. We want justice. We want education. We uh, want uh, you know some type of uh, revival. Uh, we want you know health for our ummah. We want all these different things, but do we know the efforts that it takes to get that? What kind of sacrifice? Can you do that? Just pause and reflect. Let's say he wanted to conquer Constantinople, but he didn't obsess over it. He didn't work hard for it. He didn't think about it. Uh, he didn't constantly uh, study history and try to learn from the mistakes of the past. So say, for example, it was just a hobby. Oh, yeah, you know what one day might be good is just like, you know, if we were to maybe conquer Constantinople, like, you know, that type of laissez-faire attitude. So reflect upon that. What kind of outcome did you do you want and what type of effort does that outcome necessitate? Now, here was uh, the preparation. So he personally supervised and trained the development of the army. And so I, it stated that he actually increased the size of the army to 1 million people. So approximately uh, we're looking at the 
uh, size of the army at any one time is about almost 1 million and about 250,000 of them, uh, you know, he had dedicated for this particular effort of liberating Constantinople. Uh, he had a special fourth special forces, a force known as the Janissaries uh, in Kishari. And uh, this was a special uh, trained division of the army. Very, very special skills, highly trained, highly loyal. Uh, he arranged for 400 ships, 20,000 sailors, and he built a fortress on the European side. Okay, so before there was uh, Bayezid, okay, he built what is known as Anadolu Hisari. So Anadolu Hisari is a fortress on the Asian side, okay? And uh, Rumi Hisari uh, is the fortress that he built. So then now they have a fortress on either side of the Bosphorus, okay? Uh, and that, uh, and you know, alhamdulillah, uh, the uh, the pictures are going to be, uh, you know, put uh, on there. Uh, so if you uh, if we look at like uh, the map of Asia and Europe, you'll see now there's a fortress on either side, and you see now they control the Bosphorus. Okay, so the controlling this waterway that comes from the Black Sea is a very strategic uh, location. Okay, so he built this. Uh, he uh, commissioned a uh, an expert, a Hungarian engineer by the name of Orban, alongside uh, a man by the name of Muslihuddin, to build the world's most powerful weapon at that time. Okay, so he paid this uh, engineer like four times his regular salary. Okay, and this a uh, weapon was. Uh, just like an advancement, a great advancement in military technology, like the most advanced weapon of its time. It was 27 feet long. It had a 16, six foot wide muzzle. Uh, it took 60 oxen to pull it. Okay. And when it would be, when you would be traveling with it, it you need like 200 men on either side uh, to travel with this huge gun. It fired... Uh, a cannonball 1.2 tons heavy, one mile in distance, and it would go six feet into the ground. Okay. So uh, he personally would go, the reason why he did this is he personally scaled the walls of Constantinople. Uh, he was part of reconnaissance team and he studied the composition of the walls. So I want you to think about this. He, he didn't just say, okay, tell me how thick these walls are. Okay. He went himself and he scaled it and he studied the composition. Remember, he's somebody who's also educated in the sciences. So in like the worldly sciences, the physical sciences. Okay. So he has that type of knowledge background. So he had an idea. He knew what it took to breach these walls. Now, he... Um, made alliances with other people that could be considered enemies. So he made a treaty with the people of uh, Galata, okay? Uh, and he uh, made a treaty with Hungary, with Venice. So other places that he felt could reinforce Constantinople, other possible enemies, so he could focus on a singular target. Okay, so he's now considering, see, look at the different levels that he's doing. He's not just thinking, see, a person who's arrogant and like if a person is given one particular skill, they feel that that one skill will uh, be good enough for other areas that they may need to give attention to. Okay, but he's giving attention to everything. So he's thinking about the geopolitical situation at that time. And so he's trying to politically cut off. Uh, Constantinople okay and uh, so and during this time I want you to think about this uh, he's being seen obviously as a threat he's building towards something and so the Byzantine Empire Emperor at that time he actually tried to buy off 
the Sultan. And one of the ways that people would do that, or like you could say, these little empires would retain their power and their sovereignty is that if a conqueror was coming to them, and this happened to the Muslims as well. Muslims, you know, uh, oftentimes would just separate themselves in these little divided emirates and to retain their power, say a conquering, say the Crusaders, for example, came. The Crusaders would come and there would be like an Islamic emirate or a Muslim emirate. And they, uh, to retain power, what they would do is say, hey, listen, we will um, give you money. We'll pledge you our allegiance. Just get, let us keep control over this area. And so that little king would be able to, or that little a ruler would be able to keep control of his land by basically selling out even his Muslim brothers next door, right? So um, the same strategy was employed by the Byzantine emperor. They said, okay, listen, uh, we'll give you money, gifts. We'll, uh, you know, we'll pay tribute to you, you know, but... Um, you know, we don't want you to come take this over, okay? You know, we want to have our independence. But remember, uh, Muhammad al-Fatih was somebody who had learned from a young age to sacrifice luxury. Here was a person from a young age who could have lived a spoiled life, who could have been unfocused, who could have just enjoyed the splendors of his kingdom. But a person who sacrificed from that age, uh, he has the ability he has the strength for Imsak to say no, to say no, to do what's right. And us as Muslims, we should have that training every year during the month of Ramadan. So uh, they tried to bribe many of his consultants and many of the people around him as well. And what they also tried to do was get help from the Pope. Okay, And so uh, the Pope sent a representative uh, to give a sermon from Saint Sophia Church, and when that uh, when that representative came, uh, he declared that now the two churches are going to be unified. Okay, so remember, the Pope represents Catholicism, and the uh, and uh, in the Eastern Byzantine Emp uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, known as the Byzantine Empire, uh, they pr uh, practice Orthodox Christianity. Okay. And so there was this always this political tension between the two. And so they took offense to that. So uh, the Byzantines took offense to the fact that you're saying that it's united, you, you, like it's going to be one, because they always felt that the Pope is trying to uh, encroach on their territory, their power, uh, their independence. And so uh, one of them would say that I'd rather see uh, Turkish turbans rather than the Latin hats. In, uh, in the streets of Constantinople. So now, um, again, let's go back to uh, the city itself. Remember, it's surrounded uh, by the Bosphorus Channel, the Marmara Sea, the Golden Horn. And the Golden Horn actually is protected by a chain. So access to the Golden Horn is protected by like this, ch this huge chain uh, that goes across the opening. And what that does is it prevents any ships from coming in, okay? And uh, it's also surrounded by these massive walls, um, which are uh, spaced apart, okay? So there is about a 60-meter space between these two walls. And so there's a shorter wall, about 25 feet high. And then there's a 40-foot wall behind it. And those 40 feet walls now uh, have 60 feet towers, okay? So if you're able to even breach that first wall, okay, which is heavily fortified, then now they have like this strategic advantage, okay? They have the higher ground uh, to be able to launch arrows at you, to be able to throw uh you know, uh, cannons at, or, you know, uh, cannonballs at you. They're able to uh, throw hot oil. So, uh, and they're able to, um, you know, reinforce and fix uh, that outer wall in the meantime. So it's very, very difficult, even the way that they spaced out these walls, right? So then you have the smaller one and then the higher one, you're able to see once that wall, the lower wall is breached, they're able to defend it uh, much um more readily, right? And they have a chance to repair, they have a chance to react. So it's very difficult for for any army, even if they reach the walls, like say if you're able to get over many of these natural borders, get to this man-made structure, the way it was set up 
was very difficult to breach. Okay, so um, Muhammad al Fati uh, he gave an order that uh, the ro the road from Adirne to be uh, repaired. So uh, we got to remember that the uh, capital of the Turkish Empire of the Ottoman Dawlat al Uthmaniya it moved. So it's from Bursa to Edirne to uh, eventually uh, Istanbul. And so uh, he wanted this road to be repaired so that they could um, bring these cannons and a lot of this artillery and so forth. So this journey lasted for about two months to be able to bring all of this uh, artillery to the outskirts of Constantinople. Uh, and that occurred around the, the time of uh, the 26th of Rabi al Awwal, the eight, year 875 after Hijri, which corresponds to April 6th, 1453 CE. Now, there was uh, about 250,000 soldiers that were was with this army, okay? And uh, this army was trained specifically with two things or it was infused with Quran and Sunnah. And so, uh, wet on the tongues of this army was takbir, tahleel, and dua. So, you know, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they had many scholars within this army that went with them and made dua and le led them in acts of worship and taught them and so forth. Okay. So uh, he created three main sections of this army to surround the capital from all sides, from you know Constantinople from all sides. And um, one side, though, they could not penetrate, and that was, of course, the, uh, the channel of the Golden Horn because of the chain, as I mentioned before. Now, these cannons that they used were able to make these massive holes in the walls, these structural, these massive structural holes, but they were able to repair it very quickly, okay? And so they started this attack uh, in the date that I previously mentioned, and as they're doing it, uh, Constantinople receives reinforcements from Genoa, uh, Italy, okay? And uh, they're somehow led by this commander known as Justin Tinian, are able to sneak past uh, the ships of um, Muhammad al Fatih. And uh, they quickly uh, raise the chain. They're able to uh, get past the chain and they put the chain back. Okay. And so uh, Justin Tinian, he brought reinforcements from many different European. Uh, countries, and so this was a little bit of an embarrassment for the army, for them to to allow, you know, all these ships of reinforcements to come, sneak past them, get past this, uh, you know, obviously they raise the chain and then put the chain back, okay, and they're like stuck, they're not even able to get past this chain, okay, so it was a little bit of an em embarrassment uh, for that. So, uh, again, he tries negotiations uh muhammad al-fatih actually he tries negotiation because he sees that this is going to be a long battle and so he tries to see if there can be some type of diplomatic outcome and so um he says uh that you know if you hand over the city to me i swear that my army will spare everyone's life and property Whoever wants to stay in the city will remain in peace and security, and whoever wants to leave may do also in peace and security. And they, uh, of course, they rejected it. And so uh, he had his uh, Inkashari soldiers, these very brave soldiers, on A April 18th, breached these walls with, once it was breached by uh, cannons, uh, they were able to uh, get through this like hole in the walls, like his special soldiers, but then they started receiving like heavy losses. This story, you know, they they were kind of caught in this tight in a bottleneck, and they started getting heavy losses, and so they retreated. Okay. So now again, um, they uh, they're having to reevaluate. Okay. Uh, another battle occurred where uh, he sent many different ships to approach the Golden Horn, 
and uh, Muhammad Al Fatih from the coast is viewing this fight and he's giving instructions and orders. And uh, they ended up losing uh, many of their ships. Okay. And uh, he felt very angry and very disappointed. And he actually summoned one of the commanders. Okay. So Baltar uh, and he and he accused him, he's, you know, almost of being a coward. He said, uh, um, you know, you know, what are you doing? Uh, you've like you, you're you're not trying hard enough. Where you uh, accuse him of cowardice, and so he responded by saying, "I'm facing death with a firm heart, but it hurts me to die while I'm being accused of such an accusation." He says, "I and my soldiers have fought to our best standard," and then he lifted his turban and he and it was showed that his eye was like badly injured. Okay, and so uh, Muhammad Al Fatih he accepted uh, his story, but he assigned Hamza Pasha to be in charge of the fleet at this point. Okay, so he's making decisions, not based on emotion. He sees, okay, this guy, is, he's trying his best. But uh, he um, uh, he's still, he's making a decision because maybe he sees something in his leadership that needs to be adjusted. And so now um, many people start to lose hope. Okay, and... Uh, Khalil Pasha, he's one of his ministers, uh, was trying to dissuade Muhammad al Fatih from continuing the fight. Okay, and uh, he even wrote to other rulers trying to get them to dissuade Muhammad al Fatih to continue this fight. And so, I want you to think about this you know, for any of you who are involved in dawah, for any of you um, who, who are involved in the community work and so forth, sometimes when you have a failure or you make a mistake. Many people will just jump on and start pointing fingers and try to criticize you. And those words can be devastating. Those words can be really demotivating. And before any external person can restrict you or stop you or harm you, uh, it seems that our greatest sabotage is always the naysayers within our own community. Like, you know, those cynics within our own community. And getting a positive words of encouragement, getting those positive words of encouragement, getting that dua, getting the the sunnah smile uh, from your own people can mean the world to you. And at that critical moment, uh, his sheikh, Aksham Siddin, he reminded him of the hadith of Rasul that this land is going to be conquered by this righteous, good man, this excellent person, and it will be an excellent army. So he reminded of them and he encouraged him with that. So with this encouragement now, with these words, again, a mu'min never gets stung by the same hole twice. A believer thinks. A believer keeps putting effort. A believer understands that uh, before you are externally defeated, you're actually internally defeated. You give up yourself. And so... He starts thinking about something that any normal person in that situation would never think about. He starts thinking of a plan that to this day, military strategists are in awe of this plan. Because it combines ingenuity, it combines strategy. Strategy and it combines him, like combines this, like, un uh, this undefeatable resolve. Okay, so what happens? Okay, so there is uh, from Beshiktash this area, uh, that is basically like this tip. We, we will probably bring up the map, and it's this, uh, this one coast or this one uh, uh, side of uh, the Golden uh, Horn, okay? And it's this near this area of Galata, okay? So what he does, so this is about three miles long, okay? It's hilly, unpaved road. So what he does is he orders very quickly all the trees, like a path to be cleared, Okay, he orders all these trees to be cut. He gets these barrels and barrels of oil 
and he gets these huge logs put on uh, with, on, on this oil so that you can slide these logs. And he drags 70 ships overnight, okay, to go. So you're going, these ships are in, in one night or in the street and the Bosphorus. And in one night, they end up in the Golden Horn. Okay. 70 ships. So I want you to imagine uh, that you're living on this coast in Constantinople. And within like overnight, 70 ships appear in your port. Okay. And not only do you see these 70 ships, but you hear takbir, you hear Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Okay. And they said that they saw something that they never saw before, something amazing. They saw ships sailing on land. Okay. Now, this surprise, like it's like it's like a miracle. What they saw was a miracle. But this wasn't a miracle. SubhanAllah, this was Barakah given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, this dealt a very big psychological blow uh, to the Byzantines and uh, they continued now the siege for another 40 days. So in total actually it was 54 days okay, of morning and evening uh, and, uh, and, and takbir along the way. So uh, what... Uh, Muhammad al-Fatih also brought, or he had commissioned and built, were these huge mobile fortresses, okay? And these huge, like, um, uh, mobile fortresses were had three decks, and they were meant to come up right up against uh, the walls of uh, the outskirts of the city. And uh, they were supposed to, uh, you know, be able to climb these walls, be able to attack, uh, shoot arrows and hopefully use this as a way of protecting the troops so that they could breach these walls. So uh, they had armor plating, they made them fire resistant and uh, soldiers would be near the bottom levels and then you had archers near the top levels. Okay. Now uh, the Byzantines, they fired these flaming missiles at these mobile fortresses and almost all of these mobile f fortresses got burned to the ground. But Muhammad al-Fatih, uh, he made a statement by saying, okay, tomorrow we're going to make four more. Okay. And uh, he, during this time, he's constantly trying to engage uh, the rulers uh, of uh, the city to try to come to some type of peaceful solution. And at the same time, also, he's meeting with his own Shura council. And so some of them, like Khalil Pasha, as I mentioned before, are advising him to withdraw. Okay, you know, it's, you know, you're going to enrage all of Europe. He's trying to scare him. You know, you're going to get entire Europe after you. They're going to unite to come after you. Okay. And then uh, he has others around him like Zaghnoush Basha, Torah Khan, Sheikh Shamsuddin al Mawla uh, Qurani, who say that it is necessary for him to continue uh, to fight with the same firm uh, spirit that he did initially. Okay, and he says that if you keep steadfast, that victory will be yours. So, um, Muhammad al Fatih, during this time, he's engaged with his army. So he's he goes and he meets with his men. He commands them to make taskia, make purification of yourself, increase in your salah, increase in your ibadah, increase in your dua. And he's personally even uh, going to the the ones firing the cannons, and he's telling them, like, you know what, aim your target over there, you know, aim over there. Okay, so he's intimately involved in almost every aspect of the battle. You see him commanding the ships, going to the coastline, commanding the ships, going to the cannons, looking at the situation uh, with uh, breaching the walls with the mobile fortresses, going amongst uh, the men, uh, taking. Uh, council taking shura from his leaders, from scholars, from different people, and he's you know at, at night worshiping. He's uh, you know encouraging everyone to make takbir and tahlil and so forth. 
So he reaches this state, like this is now uh, the 27th of May, 1453, Jamad al-Awwal, uh, you know, this is 857 after Hijra. And so that night, actually, that night, he has them make these big fires. And why did he have them make these big fires? He says, it's time for you to increase in your takbir, your tahleel, and we're going to celebrate because victory is imminent. Victory is almost upon us. Okay. So... When the Byzantines saw this, these fires, they were very happy because they thought that the enemy army's camps were on fire. Okay. Until they realized they were celebrating. Okay. So that gangster move really put them off. Okay. That really like gave them a psychological blow that made them very afraid. Okay. You know, these guys are already celebrating. What's going to happen now? Okay. And uh, you'd have ulama walking amongst scholars, walking amongst uh, the army, uh, reciting uh, ayat of Quran, ayat of Surah Al-Anfal, reminding them of the stories of those before in the past that sacrificed themselves, like Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And so uh, Muhammad al-Fatih gives one last speech for battle. He says, if we manage to conquer Constantinople, one of the ahadith and miracles of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam will be fulfilled by us. Everything revered in this hadith would be for us. So inform our soldiers one by one that the victory which we should gain would grant Islam such strength and honor. Every one of our soldiers should be aware of Islam's teachings during this battle. If tell them to avoid attacking the churches and places of worship. Spare the priests, the weak, and those who are unable to fight. So, you know, similar, if you, if you think about this, subhanAllah, like, this is like, we see like every great generation re repeat similar themes. Because if we see, for example, the advice that Abu Bakr Siddiq would give to his army, very similar advice, subhanAllah. Like it's very, very similar. If you look at how uh, Salah ad Ayyubi would advise his army, very similar, you know. Uh, so it, you, we see a lot of themes repeated uh, generation uh, with, uh, you know, those specific generations um, that brought Nusra to this ummah. So... Um, now, 1 a.m. on Tuesday, uh, 20th of Jamad al-Awwal, 857 after Hijra. So this is 1453 CE. This general assault on the city began. It was very well coordinated. Soldiers, cannons, ships, archers, uh, a rotation. Uh, they had hundreds of ladders uh, taken to reach the walls. And uh, after... Uh, two hours of this general intensive attack, then they told the soldiers to rest. They brought in the 3rd Brigade and a group of Inkishari soldiers uh, led by Fatih himself, Muhammad al-Fatih himself, moved towards the wall with uh, the archers. The Three of the bravest Inkishari, or these brave Inkishari soldiers, they were able to breach it and they paved the way uh, for the rest to come in and they raised the Ottoman flag behind this wall. Uh, Justin Tinian, this man who had brought in all these reinforcements, was seriously injured, uh, and he withdrew from the battlefield. He w boarded his ship, and he took off. Okay, And uh, the uh, army of Muhammad al-Fati was able to penetrate the Edirne entrance. So we can bring up the uh, the graphic again. You can see where the Adirni interest is. They were able to breach that. And um, the Emperor Constantine XI was uh, killed. And this had a very uh, big negative effect, right? Demoralizing effect on the army of the Byzantines. And so as they entered in on uh, and they were able to take over the city, as I mentioned, on the 20th of Jamad al-Awwal, 857 after Hijra, May 29th, 1453, 
the Sultan, he reached the city, Muhammad al-Fatih, he was surrounded by his soldiers and his commanders, and he kept saying, MashaAllah. And he said, you have become the liberators of Constantinople, about who our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed us. And he congratulated them for victory. He prohibited any more killing, and he commanded everyone to show mercy and kindness. And what do people do, my dear brothers and sisters, when they attain a great victory? What do they do? Do you see? Do you see like a fighter? What happens when he uh, when he achieves a great victory? He knocks out his opponent. What do they do? They jump to the to the top of the ring on top of the fence. They they jump, uh, you know, to the ropes. They stand up on the ropes and they pound their chest and they just they they raise their hands in victory, right? Muhammad al fatih he followed the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, not just in name, but in actions. He dismounted his horse and he made sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, showing humility. Remember the scene when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam enters into Mecca, Fatah Mecca. Okay, and his head is bowing, you know, in in humility as he enters into a, to Mecca. So look at him making sujood, putting your head. He's the emperor. He's a sultan. He's a conqueror, and he makes sujood. He goes into prostration to his lord, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Now, because of like their actions, um. And they saw that uh, you know the the kindness and compassion. Many people accepted Islam without compulsion because, as a rule in Islam, you cannot compel somebody to become Muslim. That's a rule, okay. And so many of them, on their own, they became Muslim. They became Muslim. And you know what's a testament to people truly believing in Islam? I, I'll give you a, re a recent example that you can reflect upon. The massive attempt to secularize at the beginning of the 20th century, okay, Kamala to Turk, massive attempt, supported by the colonizers, okay, uh, to secularize that state and to eradicate uh, Islam and just make it symbolic. After almost like decades, decades and decades of doing that, almost a century later, you're having people like 99% over 99% of them are Muslim and Islam is still there and the masajid are growing and now they're building new masajid and they're coming back to their deen uh, even though they try to ban uh, the, the Quran and the Adhan. Now again in that city, if you go into that city, you can hear the Adhan five times a day. So that's not a political enforcement. So you have to understand, when people accept Islam, and you look at the the lands where Islam is, it's not the military uh, imposition of Islam that has allowed Islam to remain. It is Islam in the hearts of people. It cannot be taken from the hearts of people. As long as you don't conquer the hearts of people, the hearts and minds of people, Islam will always be there. Now, when they took over uh, Constantinople, they uh, converted Hagia Sophia into a masjid. And about half of the churches they converted into uh, masjid. Now, according to uh, Islamic uh, rulings, Islamic fiqh, uh, if they had handed it over peacefully, they would not be able to do that. But because it was through military conquest, they were able to do that, but they only did half uh, of the uh, churches. They converted it to Masajid, Ayo Sophia being one of them. And three days after the conquest, the first Jum'ah led by Sheikh Aqa Shamsuddin was performed in Ayo Sophia. And Ayo Sophia was a masjid for almost 500 years until it was converted into a museum. And so uh, many Orientalists, they tried to paint Muhammad al-Fati in a very brutal way, okay? They tried to paint him, uh, you know, 
as this like bloodthirsty conqueror. But as I mentioned, if he came with like, if the inception of Islam was based on injustice in that area, then you would not see Islam there today being practiced so passionately. You would not see that today. And even after those attempts of secularization, even after those attempts of trying to completely uh, lobotomize Islam, you wouldn't see now that possibly Hagia Sophia would come back to being a masjid, you know, uh, as uh, is the case today. And the city itself, uh, the name changed from Constantinople to Islambul. So Islambul, which was later, uh, you know, distorted, was, you know, it evolved into being uh, known as Istanbul. But Islambul means the city of Islam. The city of Islam. And subhanAllah, I want you to think about this. Let's take a moment, man. Let's, let's soak this in. Okay. After 54 days of siege, okay, 54 days of, of, of a siege, of all this effort, these doubts, losses, being embarrassed, suffering, you know, uh, a great uh, defeat, all of these naysayers, cynics, 54 days, they remain consistent. But not, that was more than 54 days. It was more than 54 days. It was over 11 attempts. It was hundreds of years. Half half a dozen attempts was from the Dawlat uh, al-Rahmaniyya itself, like the Ottoman Empire themselves. Okay? And after all of these things, they were able to conquer this blessed city. And, you know, Muhammad al-Fati was asked, like, you know, how he managed this conquest. You know what his response was? He said, I have two traits. A heart as hard as a rock that does not rest until I achieve what I want. So what he's trying to say is that he has firm istiqama. He has firm resolve. And he says, and I that cries out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how could I not achieve victory? SubhanAllah, this is, this is, this is the, uh, <laughs> you know, this is the traits that he, that, he, that he says. He doesn't say, I'm so intelligent. I'm such a brilliant tactician. You know, I had the most advanced technology. You know why this is important to reflect upon? These are internal characteristic traits. Yet why do we blame most of our shortcomings on external factors? Why do we blame uh, like lack of success on money and resources, on uh, political power, on all these external things, media, what the media says about us, uh, all these external things, people will always say that this is the reason why Muslims are in this type of situation. Oh, we don't, we're not educated enough. We're not this enough. We're not that enough. But he says his keys to victory was essentially his istiqama, his resolve, okay, his thabat, and his taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, his, his sincerity to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, you know, being, being true to that. Now, Let's let's kind of take a, another step back here and look at uh, the type of people that surrounded him. So let's, let's also let's let's try to extrapolate the circumstances and the lessons, because I think those are very important. Let's look at see what was this recipe that manifested itself to build this beautiful cake. So you look at Sheikh Aksham Siddin. We mentioned him a few times. So his lineage, actually, he's a descendant of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He was somebody who memorized the Qur'an at the age of seven. Uh, he was actually uh, born uh, in the Byzantian lands, and he was known as like the spiritual liberator of Constantinople. He taught uh, Muhammad al-Fati uh, fiqh, 
Sharia. He taught him Quran. He taught him Hadith. Uh, he taught him Arabic, Persian, uh, the uh, Turkic language. And uh, also uh, he taught him some of the physical sciences, math, astronomy, history, military strategy. And he firmly believed, he believed that Muhammad al-Fatih was the man that our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam was referring to in the hadith of the one that would conquer Constantinople. You know, my br dear brothers and sisters, we need that in our ummah. Unfortunately, like myself, being involved uh, in dawah now for over two decades, it's hard to find supportive elders and teachers in our community. It is very difficult to find people who will invest in you and think, hey, you're going to do something great for the community. You know, like I would say for any one voice of encouragement, you probably hear 100 voices of discouragement in our community. No joke. I'm not exaggerating. That is very unfortunate. That we are so negative, like, and that, and that's, and we, and we see this in our masajid. Where are the young, bright minds? Muhammad Al Fatih was twenty-three years old, leading an army to conquer the most fortified city in the world, and he had a teacher that believed in him. Why don't we believe in each other? Why don't we believe in each other? Why is our self-esteem and our confidence so low that if like a non-Muslim says something good about like us, about Muslims, we become so elated. Wow, that's so great. Hear what this celebrity says. He says we're human beings. Isn't that awesome? We're, we're being described as human beings in the media. Yet we're, we ourselves don't give each other the, this, this hope and this positive energy and this motivation and this inspiration. Why is that? Why are, you, are we so cynical with each other? Why are there so many haters? Like a person makes an effort and just because they're not perfect, you can find a flaw, you focus on the flaw. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. And we'll, we'll talk about Muhammad al-Fatih. Muhammad al-Fatih was not perfect person. Okay, you saw, he was like almost like, when he was a kid, he was like almost a young punk kid laughing at his teachers, not taking it seriously until he got a little bit beat. So, okay, I got to take this thing more seriously, right? I got to take this tarbiya more seriously. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, having th this type of advisor, this type of voice in your life, subhanAllah, why don't we have that? That's powerful. It helped empower him. And anytime he felt doubt, he would come to Sheikh Shamsuddin uh, and he would say, it is the predestination that Allah will grant us victory. And so again, Muhammad al-Fatih came to him. You know, he's still ha having those doubts and Sh uh, Sheikh Aq comes to tells him, certainly the incident of the ships has caused mental anguish. So remember when he lost all those ships? He says, in our ranks yet cause joy amongst uh, the disbelievers. But remember that the established fact is that uh, the men's work is subject to predestination, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all the judgment. And we return to Allah. We have turned to Allah and we, ha we, re we recite the Quran. And it is only this moment of negligence will be followed by Allah's mercy with good news that was previously never witnessed before. So it's these words of encouragement instilling in him a sense of peace and sakina, you know, this piece of uh, peace and serenity. And uh, he kissed the hand of Sheikh Aqa Shamsuddin. He says, teach me a dua so that I may be successful. And the Sheikh, uh, you know, taught him a dua. And so think about this. Look at this beautiful relationship between the teacher and the student, between the sheikh and the sultan. And uh, sometime during the battle, he tried to visit uh, the sheikh, actually. And the sheikh was in his tent. 
and he was stopped by the guards. Okay, so think about this. The Sultan, you know, has to uh, be stopped by the guards of the Sheikh. And he saw, he was able to finally uh, get past the guards and he looked into the tent and he saw the Sheikh in sujood, making dua, crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for victory. And so Muhammad al-Fatih said, my happiness is not for the conquest of the city, but just the existence of such a man in our time. Wow. This, this look, look at, look at what Muhammad al-Fatih is saying. And look and, and think about sometimes how superficial we are. Maybe we get elated to see a beautiful masjid. You know, there's some in our ummah. There's some very, very beautiful masjid. How happy do you get to see that masjid? But how much happier are you when you see a true worshiper of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala crying out of fear of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in maybe a simple masjid, in a simple tent? Look at look at Muhammad Al Fadi. He said that this the conquest of the city is not what's going to make me happy. It's the fact that I'm living in a time with a man like this. And so after the victory of uh, this uh, city of the conquest of Constantinia, which became Istanbul, uh, he sought permission to spend some time with uh, the sheikh. And the sheikh, uh, he refused. He wants to spend some time with the sheikh. The sheikh says, no, I don't, I don't, you can't spend the time with me. And so... Muhammad al fatih got upset. He's like, why? Like, why can't I spend time with you? And so Sheikh Aq, he said, because when you would taste the sweetness of ibadah, you would lose uh, like interest in rulership and neglect the state. Because remember, he knows about his father. He knows that they're sincere. His father abdicated the throne because he wanted to just worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, you need to worship Allah through the r ruling the state by being the leader and even though he would want to maybe take some time relax do some ibadah he, he's telling him no no you need to make that sacrifice because he's sincere he doesn't want he doesn't get satisfied from power right so some people are wired that they get the satisfaction from power and it's a very similar story with uh, Salah ad-Din Ayyubi. Salah ad-Din Ayyubi was told uh, from Qadir al-Fadl that uh, you, know, you need to focus, you need to stay in your position. If you leave, he wanted to go, for example, for Hajj. He says, if you leave right now, they're going to come back and they're, they're going to take over. All the lands you've gained, they're going to come take it over. You cannot leave for a second. You cannot leave uh, you know, taking care of your flock just for a second. You have to get close to Allah SWT through your service to this ummah. And so uh, he said you need to get close to Allah SWT by being a just ruler. And so they visited the grave of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And so they could reflect upon those people who had sacrificed before them. And uh, and he, sheikh, he, he had kissed the, the sheikh was lying down and he kissed the sheikh's hand. And... Um, and the sheikh didn't get get up to see him leave, right? So again, he's not a perfect person. He felt like slighted, you know, that uh, I, you know, I'm the sultan, and he doesn't even get up to see me. He doesn't want to spend any time with me, and so he complained to Sheikh Waliuddin. He told him, um, you know, like what is this? Like why am I being disrespected in this type of way? And so Sheikh Waliuddin he told him that he is your teacher, and he wants you to protect. He wants to protect you from arrogance. Because the conquering of Constantinople is such a great achievement that it can be you can easily become arrogant. You can easily become prideful with that. And so, uh, you know, at one point, you know, he uh, summoned Sheikh Aq and uh, many of the uh, princes. They they kissed the, sh the the hand of the Sheikh. And so when. Uh, the Sultan came, it was dark, this area was dark at that time. Uh, Sheikh Shamsidi, he, he like grabbed him, he, he like hugged him. And he recognized him because, you know, he, he helped raise Muhammad al-Fatih. And so 
he hugged him so hard that he almost fell down. Like Muhammad al Fadi almost fell down. And all the anger with this hug, all the anger just dissipated from Muhammad al Fatih. And they spent uh, the night reading Quran till Fajr and they prayed Fajr together. So again, look at him. Here's a young guy. Think about it again. Early 20s. He gets angry at his sheikh. He's not, again, he's not the perfect person. Okay. He can uh, feel slighted. He can uh, feel like his ego is being bruised. But look at how the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as long as you stay connected, how it helps you work through all those different types of things. Okay. And I think at this point too, we should appreciate that the, uh, that ilm, how important that is. Knowledge, how important that is for Muslims. Because it was the knowledge of the Shaykh, it was the fact that Muhammad al Fatih held on to knowledge. So they weren't just worshippers, but they were knowledgeable. And that is a very key element for success for us because sometimes we don't know what and how we should do things. Okay? It doesn't matter if it's like personal issues that you're going through, family issues, communal issues. There is guidance in Al Madin to get through all of that. Think about this these are personal issues. From there to military issues, it's the connection to the deen, but through knowledge, right? So, for example, there's a hadith in At-Tirmidhi ibn Majin ibn Abbas that uh, Rasulullah says a single knowledgeable believer is harder on shaitan than 1,000 devout worshippers. 1,000, because, you know, uh, shaitan sometimes can mislead a person who's a devout worshipper because he maybe doesn't have the knowledge of how to avoid the tricks of shaitan or the knowledge how to deal with like real world challenges like real world situations whereas somebody who has knowledge right whether it's direct knowledge of the deen uh, alongside complemented with like you know knowledge of the dunya this is like a a a, a very uh, powerful recipe to be able to outsmart shaitan or a, be able to uh, keep shaitan at bay now, uh, this liberation had a uh, had a big effect on both the European world, the Islamic world. The Islamic Empire continued to um, expand. Uh, this rocked this very this shook the European world because think about it for centuries this was like their outpost uh, in the East, and now. You know they don't have it anymore. So even 200 years after the death of Muhammad al Fatih, uh, one of the uh, French historian by the name of uh, Giet, he wrote a book uh, about, um, and, and within it he wrote about Muhammad al Fatih. So he has a book he gave to Louis the Fourteenth, is the uh, King of France, and he started the, his book by. Um, Pray, uh, you know, uh, praising God or telling God to save the king, and then he also prayed to God to not bring someone like the a sultan like Muhammad al Fatih again. Okay, because uh, of the they were still scared of him two hundred years uh, after his death. Okay. Now, there's a few things uh, that we should again appreciate. Okay. Uh, that uh, before we conclude uh, today, and and that is when we look at this conquest and we look at the buildings and the fruits of what we benefit from. There was some really deep uh, work. There was some very deep characters that went involved in, in this. Okay, so. We talked about Muhammad al Fatih, right? We talked about, uh, you know, the type of person he was, the type of uh, character he had. You know, he used to sit um, and listen to the complaints of the people. So he'd actually sit there and listen to people, what their complaints are. You know, he was the type of person uh, who supported, uh, you know, students. So he, he built many schools. So hundreds of schools, he built many uh, schools. He had scholarships for poetry, okay? Uh, if he knew anybody who had knowledge or Muslim scholars, he would treat them with respect. He would hire them. He would pay them salaries. 
Uh, he ordered uh, doctors and hospitals to check on their patients regularly. He, um, you know, he told them to bring good food uh, to the patients. Uh, he, uh, he developed a lot of administrative laws to help manage the state affairs. Uh, he, you know, if you look at it, uh, he had seven. He was had seventeen states in Asia uh, and Europe that was under his control. Okay, he had great love for the dean. Like one time, he heard that somebody had um, insulted a judge uh, who was representing Islam. So he he became very very angry, and then he found that the judge was actually acting inappropriately, and he got angry at the judge, and he was almost. Uh, you know, going to give him a corporal punishment, but then, you know, the other scholars dissuaded him from doing that. Uh, he wanted to look at the state of the people and he would check in on the condition of the people because you have to remember something. This is, this is an important point that you could have the best leader in the world. You could have like a phenomenal leader. So you can have like uh, somebody who's an amazing, like the best leader that you could ever hope for. It's like, man, this person has it all. But if you don't have the jama'ah to support that person, you know what's going to happen? That person will just be by themselves. They won't be able to affect any change. Even the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the sahaba, radiallahu anhu. Allah blessed the messenger with the best generation. And there were good people. There was decent, righteous people, people who had taqwa that uh, surrounded and supported the community that Muhammad al fatih lived in. So for example, uh, he went undercover once in the community, okay, and he went into the marketplace. And he went uh, to buy from a shop uh, some cheese, milk, and honey. And so the shop's owner said, listen, I'll uh, sell you the cheese, but I've made my sales for the milk and honey today. Go go buy from my brother next door. He still needs to make his sales. So he goes uh, to, uh, you know, to, to the one next door. And he says, you know what? I'll sell you the milk, but I've made my sales for the day, why don't you go to the next business and buy your honey from him? And so he goes to the next business. Think about this. He says, like, you know, people like this, with people su with such akhraq and such unity, such ikhuwa, you know, we won't just conquer Constantinople. We'll conquer the world. You know, like, think about why people revere um, a lot of Western countries, because they feel that they can get justice. Right? Because people can put up with a lot. Like people can put up with, uh, to a degree, poverty, and they can put they can put up with a lot of different things. But it's injustice uh, never allows serenity to take place within a society. Okay, that society will not be truly successful without justice. Okay, and so um, he saw this. We have people like this. We have people who care, who have a true sense of community amongst each other, okay? Now, I want to talk about, before I conclude, just a little bit about tamkeen, about victory, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving power, like power to people. Now, the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are powerful. And I think we underestimate the power of the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa the, the teachings of the blessed messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I think we greatly underestimate it. Maybe because, I don't, uh, maybe perhaps we didn't have to sacrifice so much for Islam. Maybe the hadith are so widely and readily available. You don't have to go sacrifice and travel so far to study it and learn it like the scholars did in the past. You just Google, get a whole bunch of different collection of hadith. But... The hadith are so powerful when they are implemented. Sitting on a shelf, they don't really do you much good. They don't affect change uh, if it's just relegated to trivial knowledge. 
But if it's actually implemented, okay, so it's made operational, that hadith is made operational, you see a big difference. So, for example, you have uh, somebody like Abdullah bin Umar, uh, he would go to the marketplace and he would say, Assalamu alaikum to people, his students would be following him, and then he would come back and his students would say, Why do you keep going to the marketplace? You don't see. Like you're not buying anything there, you're not selling or buying anything there. He says, I want go there simply to practice the hadith of Rasul to spread the salam. That's why I go to the marketplace. SubhanAllah. He goes to the marketplace to make what? Tijara in uh, goods and services? No, no, no. With hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With practice of the hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the power the hadith are power like what our Rasul Sallallahu says is powerful. Think about it. The Battle of Uhud, the disobedience of one instruction of our Rasul Sallallahu led to a huge this uh, devastation. Many of the Sahaba being martyred, almost our Rasul Sallallahu being killed. You know, this, uh, this, this, this devastation that occurred to the Muslim army. Think about the implementation, the following of one hadith of Muhammad al-Fatih of a Rasul وسلم, caused world history to be changed following a single hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam caused world history the events of world history to be changed forever so we have to truly benefit and we have to realize what effect that can have just by following one hadith and we have to understand the nature of success we have to understand the nature of how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the sunnah of our allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of how the world works because it doesn't come through just rhetoric it doesn't come from just tweets it doesn't just come from social media posts it just doesn't come from being like a uh, armchair uh alim or daya it comes from something a little bit more uh imam shafi uh, was asked yeah Aba Abdullah, ayuma afdal li rajul ayumakin aw yubtila. So he was asked, "What is the best for a man to be given authority in the land and power in ruling, or to be stricken with calamities?" Imam Shafi he responded by saying, "La yumakinu hatta yubtila." He says, a man would not be given tamkeen authority, okay, power, until he is stricken with calamities and trials and is tested. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ إِبْتِلَى نُوحًا وَإِبْرَاهِيمٌ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى وَمُحَمَّدٍ صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْهِ أَجْمَعِينَ فَلَمَّا سَبَرُوا مَكَّنَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he indeed trial he tested and sent calamities upon nu ibrahim musa isa and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, be uh, pleased and send uh, we send the blessings of peace on all of them when they were uh, taken through calamities allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them calamities and they were patient through calamities then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them tamkin he said that's a prerequisite. Trials and tribulations are a prerequisite. This thing that we've been running away from for so long. I don't want to be stressed out. I don't want to take responsibility. Let me just generally volunteer. Let me just come in here and do like a few tweets. I'll like a few things. I'll like donate a few dollars very electronically, very, very quickly. I, I just want to have like ease, comfort. I, I don't want to uh, do anything that requires so much effort. 
Imam Shafi is saying is that if the greatest creation, the greatest ones to ever live, had to go through trials and tribulations to be given authority in the land, who are we? Who are we? Because you can pick. You can pick. You either you take the trials and tribulations, okay, or you pick humiliation. Pick pick one or one or two things. Pick humiliation or pick trials and tribulations. Trials and tribulations lead to tamkin. Humiliation leads, you know, neglect leads to humiliation, leads to oppression. Pick which path. Choose choose your own adventure. Which 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 page do you want to turn to? You know, it's like if uh, and that's when you truly test. You see the hearts of people. Like it's like, for example, you had a basketball team, and it was a basketball team that every time another team faced it, they would just forfeit. So that basketball team would be like number one now. Every single time an opposing team did, they just forfeit. How do you know if this is a really legit, really good basketball team? You know, how do you know that they're like champions? How do you know who's the quitter, who's the all-star, who's the average player? How do you know any of that? Until they're tested. Until they go through, you know, the what happens with their victories? What happens with their losses? You know, we, we all want... You know, we, we, we don't look at the whole situation sometimes and we don't appreciate our own history to its full extent. Think about this. Uh, like, again, let's go back to uh, uh, like uh, Uhud and let's talk about Badr for just a moment. Battle of Badr. Okay. Great victory, right? Great victory. Battle of Badr. Greatest, one of the greatest victories in Islam. But after that great victory, that's when many... You had a high number of Muslim people accepted Islam, like a high number of Muslim converts. And many of them were munafiqeen. This is the first time after the Battle of Badr, you had munafiqeen, hypocrites, in the ranks of the Muslims. After a great, beautiful victory. After Uhud, one of the greatest losses and calamities, you had a separation. After that loss, you had a separation. Of Munafiqeen and the Mu'mineen, the true believers and the hypocrites. Through that. Okay. My dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in Surah Al An'am, Ayah 11, He says, Say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, travel in the land and see what was the end of. Of those who retract, rejected the truth. If we reject the truth, if we reject our history, if we reject our guidance from the Quran and the Sunnah, we can look at the history, travel through the land, and see what was the end of our people, of our community, of our Ummah. Conversely, look at the successes, look at, go and visit Ayo Sophia, go visit the uh, Sultan Muhammad al Fatih Masjid, go visit Abu Ayyub Masjid, go see the worshippers to this day, hundreds of years later, after all, the, all these attempts to dissuade them. Look at the seeds that were planted by people on the truth. How it continues to bear fruits. We can reflect upon it ourselves. So I hope we have an appreciation of how Ayo Sophia became a masjid. And as I mentioned, for many decades it was converted into a museum. But perhaps we're in the final stages of it being a masjid again. And we are pleased with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be on the haq like the people of the past were on the haq. 
And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us united upon the haq. So my dear brothers and sisters, we will see you all on Saturday at our next podcast episode. Remember, we want to live by the haq, die by the haq. And just when you think life is stuck, tune in to life haq. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.